it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Gene St. Louis, who's the CEO a nationally recognized expert in dental practice management. She built her company from the ground up, holding both clinical and administrative positions prior to her consulting career. Having participated in the day-to-day operations of dental practices gives Gina a unique insider advantage of how offices succeed. Clients feel confident with her firsthand experience that translate into relatable, personable, and reliable expertise. Gina's worked with hundreds of clients nationwide. She writes for a variety of dental publications and is regularly invited to speak at the nation's top dental meetings throughout the United States and Canada. Jean St. Louis Consulting is passionate about creating a relationship-oriented, tailored approach to dental practice management coaching. Her team provides guidance, education, and direction specifically personalized to you as a business owner. They continue to make an enormous impact through their commitment in helping dentists and their teams establish exceptional customer service and the successful practice they envision when they hire them. They believe every dentist deserves balance and productivity to secure their financial future her website is gene st louis consulting so how did you so your name is gene st louis so a lot of you people listening want to know who was st louis named after and i literally have her on the show today how cool is that gene so st louis was named after the um what was it st louis he was the um St. Louis the ninth, he was the king of France. He was the only king of France ever to be canonized as a saint. And I noticed that now you're in San Diego. So you just like the saint stuff. Now you're in St. Diego. Uh, So St. Louis and St. Diego, uh, thanks for coming on the show today. Um, I asked you to come on the show. You didn't ask me. I really wanted to get you on the show because most of the listeners are millennial. They're 30 and under. Old guys like me read books. Um, young people, they, you know, they listen to YouTube and podcasts and all that stuff like that. And what I wanted to ask you first, how, how long you've been doing this since 80, since in the eighties, right? Right. I've been in the field for about 37 years. Um, started out as a dental assistant, went to school for that right out of high school. Um, and basically had a passion for dentistry from the beginning and moved from the clinical end to the administrative end and found that while I loved the clinical aspect and assisting, I really had a passion for the administrative. And that really became my niche and loved it and went from there to, you know, office manager and all the way through to consulting and um, worked with a firm early on in my career and um, offered to buy them out twice. They were a local based firm out of Chicago, which was where I was born and raised. And they didn't want to sell and I decided to do my own thing. And so that kind of began my consulting career. So here's a dilemma I see. Um, When I got out of school, I graduated May 11th and 133 days later, I had my office open September 11th. I just celebrated my 31 career, 31 year anniversary of today's dental here in Phoenix. And now it seems like these kids come out of school and they think, oh, that's too risky or I should just go get a job. And they uh, they go work for a DSO, but they're not very happy because when they go work for a DSO or they're an associate in private practice, the, the job turnover is about a year per stint. You talk to these kids five years out of school, they've had five, six or seven associateship jobs. So does did did my generation were they quicker to open up their own office than today is that because of student loan debt um has the market changed in 30 years is it harder to come out of school and open up a de novo and do you even recommend a de novo should they buy a practice start a de novo is that what i like to do is ask 39 questions at once so maybe one of them is good enough for you to answer that's right, right up my alley. That's my style. My kids say I always ask a billion questions and, and just need to chill. So, yeah, let me address some of those. Um, having been in dentistry a long time like you have, it is a different world than when you started and that you could kind of hang your shingle up, if you will, and, you know, patients came. There really wasn't a lot of external marketing or efforts. There wasn't social media and all, all of that. And and in answer to your question, you know, can a doctor go out and do a de novo? Absolutely. And can they purchase a practice? Absolutely. Is the risk as high as it was back when you did it? Um, You know, there is more student debt, but the reality of it is, is that there's good debt and bad debt. And student debt isn't necessarily bad debt. Credit card debt is bad debt, but student loans are not bad debt. 
And so when I look at a young dentist coming out, what I see is that they often, you're absolutely right, they go into a DSO, they make really great money the first few years. They're doing, you know, that dentistry in a high end, high technology based practice, which they love, kind of similar to the schools that they probably went to. Um, I love DSOs from a from an associate standpoint because they get their speed up. I think that's great. But what I often get, and and I and I've talked with colleagues, and if if a colleague of mine is not dealing with startup dentists or dentists that are purchasing practices, they don't encounter what I feel I encounter often, which is calls from dentists saying, "I'm just burnt out. I'm in my late twenties, early thirties." And I just can't do it. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to own my own thing, whatever that is, either a startup or an acquisition. And so my passion has always been to help these dentists kind of charter those waters because um, while they feel they have you know, been exposed to practice management in the DSO setting, and they, and they probably have, and, and that's a great thing, they're still not where they need to be in regards to understanding the intricacies of that startup or that acquisition. I, I agree that that's why I love DSOs. They provide all these jobs for these new graduates. When I was little and got out of school at age 24, you could really only do that in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Associateship jobs were hard to find. Um, so I, I really credit these DSOs for hiring all these people that I don't really want in my office because when you hire some kid out of dental school and he takes an hour to do an MOD composite and then the thing falls out in a month, that's it's not very fun. So I, I really credit it for them, but but it just seems like they're not happy even in the big fang stocks which are down 27 percent lately um facebook apple amazon netflix google um they're only keeping their millennials for a year or two so when facebook and google give you all these perks and free food and free foosball and whatever whatever they can't even keep um millennials um happy it just seems like dentists are mostly only happy when they're a totalitarian dictator and own their own business and answer to no one. They're just not good people um, to manage under your thumb. And so, um, but how do they get over the fear of, of being so miserable that they just need to do what they need to do? They need to open their damn business. What, what, how do you armchair psychology them from the safety of an eight to five job they can't stand to the horrors of owning your own business? I think the first thing is identifying for them, first and foremost, that when they started, when they, when they had the idea to become a dentist, they never at the same time that they said, I'm gonna go to dental school, never did they say in their mind, and I probably am gonna fail as a dentist. What they said is, I'm gonna go to dental school and I'm gonna become a great dentist. And so I try to bring them back to that and say, don't embrace, you know, don't don't um, go forward with trying to decide, do I do a startup or, or should I do an acquisition without really understanding you're not doing it and you're going to fail. So knowing that in, you know, armor yourself with as, as much data as you can within both of those arenas is a startup better for you or is an acquisition i often talk to dennis and i say listen if you talk to a colleague that has done a startup he or she is going to say to you oh my god i would never do an acquisition that's the worst thing you're buying someone else's horrible culture you have to change it the staff salaries are high however if you talk to a colleague that has purchased an acquisition you'll hear the exact opposite. Like, I would never do a startup, that's so risky, that's really, so my job or what I feel a dentist needs to educate themselves on are the nuances of each, one being the startup and one being the acquisition. In a startup, you have to really analyze, um, first and foremost, you know, fallacy put aside, the banks are lending money to startups. Are all banks? No, but the reality of it is, is if you have anywhere from two to four hundred thousand dollars worth of student debt, they are lending money to a startup dentist around five hundred thousand, five fifty, depending if you're a specialist, to do a startup. So in that arena, when you know that the banks are lending, the banks have, you know, really the write-off amount that a bank writes off on a startup is less than a half a percent. So that's telling you that practices are not failing. Startups are not failing, nor are acquisitions. 
if an acquisition fails, it's generally because the dentist that bought the practice was n- did not do proper due diligence. You'll hear people complain, oh, I was sold a bill of goods from a broker. I was sold, you know, in mis- misrepresented data. Well, it's up to you, just like, and I tell dentists this all the time that are acquiring a practice, if you purchased a home, would you not get that home inspection done? And they all say, yes, of course I would. It's the same thing in a practice. You have to get the due diligence done on that practice. Part of it is from your trusted advisors of your accounting firm and your attorney, of course, to review leases and things like that. But the other big piece is the dentistry, the business of dentistry aspect of that acquisition. So really understanding what are you buying? What opportunities are there? What risks are there? So So is this true or false well first of all i'm just gonna point blank it do demographics matter now i know if i was gonna start a de novo um which means you start from scratch the demographics would really matter but if i'm buying an existing practice this business is already working in this democ in this demographic area so do demographics matter only on a de novo do you think they matter on a um when you're purchasing a practice I believe they matter in both a de novo and a a purchasing of a practice. While you have the historical data of an acquisition to fall back on to say, okay, historically I can see the growth and what has occurred. I think it's equally as important to look at those demographics to say, well, what does the growth look like in the future? What is the economics in that area? What's the education level? And yes, it's not as critical in a startup as it is in an acquisition, but either one, it is definitely critical. I think in, an, in a startup, you want to make sure, you know, the, the old adage, you know, location, location, location is very, very important in a startup. If you're not really um, paying attention to that location, 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 you end up getting yourself in a situation where you have no exposure, the growth in the area isn't there, and you're really, putting setting yourself up for a situation where it's much harder it's it doesn't have to be that hard in a startup the other question i often get asked from dennis is you know do i have to join every hmo and every you know medicaid and things like that when i'm doing a startup and the answer that i have is no you, generally speaking accept some ppos and fee for service and those practices survive and thrive so you don't necessarily have to. Now, there are some dentists out there that say, no, I want to give back. I, I really feel I want to be in a community where I accept, you know, HMO programs and whatnot. And that's personal choice. That's their own vision and mission. And, of course, that's important to them. Then it's important to me. So I think due diligence matters a hundred times more than now because back when I was little, when you bought a practice, the owner carried. So they actually make their money three ways, which I think was a much better business model. I want to talk about that for a second. So let's say you sold your practice back in the the day, 500,000, but you carried it at 10 years, 10% interest. So the doctor would have an income stream for a decade And then, so he'd basically uh, make another nice income stream for 10 years. And then third, he owned the land and building. And as soon as the practice was paid off, then he went back to the doctor and says, well, now that you own this practice, would you like to own the land and building that it sits in? And then he would sell him that and carry that for another 10 years. So he could retire at 65 and have an income stream till he was 80 or 85 years old. It was amazing. But when I'm carrying the money and I'm a dentist, I want to know, I want to make sure that you're going to be successful in my practice. So you're buying my practice, Wichita, Kansas. Do I like you? Are you a good guy? Are you going to tell the truth and not overdiagnose and build trust in the community? Or, you know, were you born here? But now that we got rid of the owner carry and now we have these big national banks that might be a thousand miles away from the practice they just want to do the deal so that dentist buying that practice is is being courted by a slick salesman the dentist wants to sell him everyone's telling him he's wonderful and beautiful and it's going to be a, a, a slam dunk because they're just going to get their money and run and know that since dentistry is so non-competitive that you only have a half percent chance to fail. So a lot of times I think these kids get stuck with a very bad purchase because they don't understand due diligence. Do you, do you agree or disagree with what I just said? Um, I would say partly agree, partly disagree. I, 
I think that, yes, in the day when, you know, Dennis could, could carry the note, if you will, versus the bank carrying the note, those were different times. I mean, the reality of it is the saddest thing for me is when I'm talking to a dentist that's between 60 and 70 or 55 and 70, and they are not prepared for their retirement. They're not prepared. They haven't saved what they should. And and then they're going to sell their practice or so they think they're going to sell their practice and they think they're going to get, they realize at this point in the game that they're not going to retire on what they sell their practice for. Those days are long past. But the, at the end of the day, that dentist that is selling their practice now, I feel most of them want out. They, they, they absolutely want to walk away. There are a select few that say, I really care about that patient base and I want the goodwill transfer and I want to do it slowly and that type of thing. But generally speaking, I feel that, that most dentists that are selling absolutely want out. And yes, it's true that if you have the real estate end of it, you can sell the practice and still like the old days, if you will, when, you know, you would carry the note and then sell the building 10 years later, that still can occur. Um, but I, I don't see dentists carrying the note anymore for obvious reasons. They can't afford to. So I, I do believe that the dentists that are purchasing the practice make some common mistakes and the common mistakes they make in the due diligence is that they, they simply think they know it all. In other words, because they've associated for those large DSOs and they've been exposed to probably more practice management than, you know, dentists in your day, perhaps when you were starting out, the reality of it is, is that they don't know what they don't know. And when they're exposed to the due diligence end of, you know, hey, listen, here's what's happening in that practice. They have this amount of past due recall that has a direct impact on your future going forward. You can't just have your staff that have been there for 20 years operate as business as usual because there's opportunities there. And you have a vision as a dentist taking over that obviously you wanna, you wanna run that practice differently, same way, but differently than the dentist that owned it previously. And as part of that running of that practice, while you don't want to turn things topsy tail and really create a bunch of, you know, um, upheaval by no means, you want to keep the practice running as smoothly as possible. But the reality of it is, is that there's much opportunity in most of those practices that the seller doesn't even realize they had. And the buyer clearly isn't identifying it always on the front end. And so they're kind of stuck in, in a spot where they purchase it and then get frustrated. Does that does make sense. And your point in that the reason they can't carry the note is because they're in financial they're not financially ready, but when you listen to all these financial lectures, you know, they always go into the details of like uh, exchange, exchange traded funds or this or that, or, you know, all these details of investing and they, they don't even talk about the, what really matters. I mean, forget all the details of how to invest stocks versus bonds versus whatever. It comes down to how many times did you get divorced? Did you have two kids or four? Um, did you send your kids to the local state cheap community college and in-state college or did you send them to some name brand Ivy League? And it always comes down to it's not what you earn, it's what you burn. I mean, like on your vacations, are you camping at the lake in a tent and pulled a pop-up trailer or did you take your whole family on a Mediterranean cruise? I mean, I just, I just see the people who can retire at 50, same wife, moderate house, they, they're not big spenders. They don't vacation in Hawaii. They go to the lake. They go camping. So, so dentists, lawyers, physicians have a spending problem. Why did you buy an $85,000 Beamer instead of a, a, a $30,000 uh, normal car? Uh, but back to these due diligence, it's the same thing. Like when, when these accountants and brokers are doing due diligence, they're talking about the, the blue sky value of the, the, the brand. They're talking about equipment accounting. But do they analyze 
the practice management software, the systems, the HR? I mean, are we, am I buying a dental office filled with people who've been there two years on average versus six or eight years? Do these people, do they have any systems? Do they know what they're doing? How do, do you think these kids are getting an accounting, um, how this looks to the IRS report on buying this practice? Or do you think they're getting the due diligence of, hey, is this a functional business with systems and good people? I don't. I think that while there is definitely, and I most of my you know referrals of dentists come from accountants and attorneys. So I work with them very closely across the United States. Each professional has their role. Obviously, you would never close on a practice without an attorney. You'd never want to purchase a practice without having a, an accountant look at the tax returns. The reality, though, is that there's so much other in, intricate parts of that practice, as you mentioned. You know, the HR issues, how long has the staff been there, the accounts receivables, the recall system, how many active patients, how is the recall system functioning, how many new patients are they getting in, Um, how, you know, all of those components of the business aspect, the actual practice management software, getting into the practice management software, pulling up the necessary reports, and not just pulling the reports, but analyzing those reports to say, is the practice up, down, sideways? Are they referring out endo and, and perio? Are they perio charting? Are they six point perio charting? Or are they, they doing a PSR system? Like to what extent are they taking FMXs? Are they doing it every six or seven years, every three to five years? How often are they doing bite wings? Are they doing periodic exams every time the patient comes in for a profi and so on? So those are little intricacies that should be evaluated that I often think do not get evaluated. And it, and then when the practice and the new owner are in place, things kind of start bubbling to the surface if even the doctor identifies that, even if they have the knowledge. Most of them, I don't believe, do have the knowledge of knowing, hey, this practice could be functioning better, but I don't know the opportunities that exist. So... Nice. Um, you are uh, a legend um, for over the years. You created a program called Building the Ideal Practice. Um, do you still do you still um, have that system, that program? I don't. I don't. But I do. What I do have is a that that program was designed for dentists that were out of school ten years or less that were either considering being. Um, a practice owner from a startup capacity or from an acquisition capacity. And so um, what I did was I morphed that program into the two kind of programs that I have now and one being an acquisition program or a due diligence um, program and then a startup program. And so what my passion has been over the years is not that I don't work with established dentists, because I absolutely do, but I really feel that the dentists that are, um, you know, purchasing those practices, either in a startup or an acquisition capacity, just lack the information that they need to make good business decisions as a business owner. And I found that the Building the Ideal Practice was a wonderful program. I touched many lives, um, was very, very fortunate, worked with Gordon Christensen for quite some time on that and other great clinicians. Um, And what I found was that dentists really, they loved the camaraderie. They loved the idea that they could have someone to go to to really help them execute their vision and their mission. And that, that really has kind of held a place in my heart for all these years. I mean, and that's why I really still feel so strongly with helping dentists the way that I do. So, and let, let me tell you to my listeners, she's uh, shy and humble, but I mean, uh, Jean St. Louis, um, I mean, she was with Mercer, uh, vice president of business development for six years from 2006 to 2012. Then she went over and joined uh, Sally McKenzie, a rock star, uh, for another six years. I mean, you've worked with two of the greatest legends. I mean, MTS Manji and Mercer, Sally McKenzie and McKenzie Management. I mean, you really, really know your stuff. Uh, what are my homies going to find uh, if they go to your uh, website, uh, GeneStLouisConsulting.com? 
I hope what they're going to find is a feel about my passion for what I deliver to clients. Um, the first thing on my website that you're going to see is a video from Five for Fighting on 100 Years. And it's a great song. And the reason I put it on my website is because I feel so strongly that we all, you know, we can only hope that we have 100 years to live. And what are we going to do with our life? You know, we have a choice in what we do with our lives and how we embrace our careers and, and the passion that we put forth. What I hope that someone would gleam off of my website is that, wow, this woman has passion. She has, in, you know, intelligence. She knows what she's doing. While, yes, I, you know, sold my first consulting business to Mercer Advisors and then moved on to McK McKinsey Management, my passion and why I'm back really kind of doing my own thing again is I realize that there's nothing like really helping dentists from your own perspective, from me, not directing consultants to do it, not, you know, coaching others to do it, but really going back into the roots and saying, hey, I want to do it myself because I'm at a point in my career, I'm, a, I'm afforded that opportunity, I don't have to work, I choose to work, and I choose to work because I'm passionate about what I do. I think, you know, when in talking to clients that have me, um, as their consultant, what I what I often hear is, my gosh, you answer calls yeah. now in, in the night and over the weekends, and do you ever sleep? And I think, you know, the energy that I have comes from the passion within. And so I'm really blessed. I've been very blessed with that. And so I hope that my website conveys that. So is that song on um, a YouTube video, um, is that the Superman song for Five for Fighting? Um, Five for Fighting, it's called 100 Years. I don't know if it's a Superman song, but it's a song that um, I love. It's it's just, now, it's about 100. Now, now can, is, is it okay to put a YouTube video on your website like that? There's no copyright problem putting some musicians' YouTube video I haven't, on? I haven't yet had a copyright issue. Huh. I, I made one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, thought, I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, so... So what, it, what it, if, um, if you, you go to McDonald's, you know, they're, they're, they're 80 percentiles of hamburger, fry and Coke. You go to a dentist, it's a, you know, cleaning exam, filling crown. Um, if a hundred people called you up, what is your hamburger, fry and Coke? What, what are the top three things people are calling you? What, what problems are they having that you're solving in the marketplace today? Um, the problems that I'm solving in the marketplace today with um, existing dentists are generally staffing concerns, um, growth concerns, and, um, and sometimes embezzlement concerns. Um, what I find with my younger dentists, my millennials and Gen Xs that are tired of associating is, you know, guide me through making a decision. I don't know if I should do a uh, de novo or uh, acquisition. And so I walk them through those steps of both what it looks like so that they have a better understanding of that. So when, when you're, when you're, um, you know, you've been doing this for three decades is, is, is it so much obvious that you're going to be more successful in rural? I mean, it seems to me that, you know, if, if your office is two hours from a, an airport that has Southwest airlines, you're just crushing it compared to an office that's 10 minutes up the street from an airport. Um, do you, do you, let, let's so first do the, the basics rural to urban. Do you think that's a really big deal? It's interesting. I've worked with um, many rural dentists, and um, the biggest hurdle that a rural dentist face, they're definitely serving a population. And if you look at a lot of the DSOs, I mean, they were smart that they went into rural areas, right? That They hit the market of where the market needed to be served. Very smart. The downside is a lot of dentists don't want to live in a rural area. So I've had clients that I've worked with that you know, are in rural Indiana, very rural, you know, Warsaw, Indiana, county seat, but yet only 10 or 11 dentists in that county seat and having, you know, maybe four of them as clients, all of them were very successful and yet they couldn't find associates to come to that area because it was two and a half hours from Chicago. Um, and so if you, you know, if you are okay with a rural area, hey, find the greatest rural area you can be in and, and serve that community. You will be busy as all get up. 
Yeah. But a lot of dentists don't like that, right? They want the city or they want a mix of a little bit of city and, and rural. So um, in those situations, you have to really do a best sites review to see, well, in this general area that you want to go in, what is going to serve you best for future growth? And then when you look at a business, which do you think, if some kids starting up an office just point blank you, what practice management software would you use? What would you, what would you tell them? I don't have stock in any one company. So what I tell them is just that. I don't accept kickbacks from any one company in regards to what I recommend. If I recommend something, it's because I've used it or I know clients that have used it. It's served well. And that's why I recommend it. I've done due diligence to feel confident to recommend. Typically speaking, your Dentrix, your Eagle Soft, your Open Dental, are, uh, your Soft Dent, those are all, you know, t- I would say probably top four programs that, that are out there that are servicing the clients well. Um, I do accept kickbacks. If you want to send me a million dollars, that's my minimum price. Send a million dollars to Howard Ferran, Phoenix, Arizona. I will sell my soul for one million in cash unmarked bills preferably in a briefcase uh but anything less than a million in cash um it's funny you said dentrix eagle soft open dental uh soft Dent. we i was on soft Dent for 30 years and 2018 we just switched to open dental what i liked about open Dent, and i have no financial connection open dental doesn't even advertise um and i get um um that open dental is just, it's just open so you know programmers if you have open dental and you have some other say say it's a phone software uh, um, for measuring your income account just any other piece of software you can hire a programmer for 50 bucks an hour and start connecting things together you know uh, i i see it especially when i go overseas like like some uh, guy um, bought open dental in uh, toronto and um, once you buy open dental it's open so what do you do he went in there and converted the whole thing to french and that's what I see in Cambodia and Indonesia and Thailand. When, when I, I lecture around the world, I mean, you see open dental around the world just because it's open. They could go in there. I mean, imagine if you were in um, uh, Cambodia uh, or Vietnam and you wanted it, you know, in, in, in your language. So, but what I, what I was so excited about is um, trying to get long distance scheduling. What I want to do with Open Dental is I want it so that if I roll my phone over to a receptionist and, uh, and pay her and she open and she has that call from say uh, uh, six o'clock to late or Saturday or Sunday, I want her to be able to go into Open Dental and schedule an appointment from her damn iPhone. You know what I mean? So that, that that so that's why I switch. It's it's going to be a long time, long term romantic journey. But but I think Dentrix and Eaglesoft. I mean, probably what two out of three dental offices that buy software probably pick those two. Don't you think those are the four hundred pound gorillas? They are. They are. And the reason being is, you know, as I tell Dennis, when a new software comes out, just because it's the cheapest guy on the block or the cheapest software out there, doesn't mean you should just jump into it right away because of the price. You know, there's something to be said about the fact that the research behind those companies like Dentrix and Eaglesoft that can put many, many users out there and they're able to, you know, to correct, correct their versions as they go based on user feedback, that's a plus. And and based on the amount of users they have, that's a plus. The other plus is that because when a dentist is hiring a new staff in in a de novo or a startup situation, you know, the, the interviewees that are coming in, most of them have been and are familiar with the Dentrix and the Eaglesoft. Now, we're seeing that switch a little bit more now towards Open Dental. But overall, the, the amount of people out there have much more exposure to Eaglesoft and Dentrix than Open Dental. So those, those employees that you're hiring on, you know, especially as a startup, it's so critical that they understand the software. Now, you know, hey, you can get training from any software company, Dentrix, Eaglesoft, Open Dental. Um, it's just, you know, are you having a trainer come in or is it over the internet, you know, virtually? People learn different ways. So e- either way, I mean, I, I, I let the dentists do the due diligence on those softwares themselves. I encourage them to, you know, have a demo of each one of them 
and compare and ask them what have they used in their associate position? Why did they like it? Why did they not like it? And make an educated decision. So I think a big part of purchasing any technology is, is educating yourself and not just following you know, the, the path or the, the sheeps ahead of you. Really kind of step out of that, that, you know, that scope of who's doing what and kind of evaluate and make decisions on your own. Well, I'll tell you another, and I'll tell you another thing. Uh, you know, follow the money. You know, money's the answer. What's the question? Solve so many riddles, and Open Dental is the only one that doesn't advertise. I mean, I could barely, barely. I still haven't got the owner dentist to come on to a podcast show. His brother came on, and but they said, "Look, look, we're growing too fast. We we don't want we don't spend money on marketing. We're just trying to do a good job in our expansion." I mean, it, it's and the other ones uh, advertise a lot. So I mean, I. I still, I know you're agnostic, um, but I, I, just, I still think Open Dental is going to be long-term growth. And one, one other thing about the Open Dental and the software uh, systems or whatever, you, I asked you, what are the three reasons people are calling you? And you said startups, growth issues, embezzlement. What percent of dentists um, that you've consulted with are being embezzled? What, what percent of the dentists today on this very Monday um, on November 26, 2018, the Monday after Thanksgiving, are being embezzled today in their office and don't even know it? Oh, you know, I, I wish I had that number. I could take a guess. Um, the sad thing is, is that they just don't know enough about their business <laughs> or, or their systems to even know they're being embezzled. And, you know, if, if I could give one bit of advice, it would be run an adjustment, you know, report, see what your adjustments are. The, the, you know, easiest way for a person to embezzle is through making adjustments. Um, there's other easy ways. I mean, I was involved in the largest case in Illinois history, um, several years back on embezzlement. And so, um, I, I, it saddens me to think that dentists are out there and they're being taken advantage of the, the message I would give to dentists that have been embezzled is please, please prosecute because many of them that have been embezzled feel as if um, they're embarrassed. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, how could I have been so vulnerable? How could I have let this happen? How stupid am I? Instead of really taking a step back saying, what can I do to learn from this? And secondly, um, quit being so trusting. Quit being so trusting of someone with your money. You've got someone at the desk that's collecting a half a million to a million dollars, even a quarter of a million dollars, and you're so trusting with everything that person does. Um, and and that if, if anything, just make sure you prosecute because the frustrating thing, and you can talk with dental reps all over the industry, when they see someone at one practice, they know that she's embezzled and they go down the street and she's at Dr. Jones' office, working the front desk, doing the same thing to him, unknown victim. Yeah, and I love it. You know, I love humble people. Humble people do so much better in life because they raise their hand, they ask for help. It's the opposite of pride. And I love it when these dentists are so humble, they go on dental town. There's a big thread over Thanksgiving about this guy getting embezzled. And the story is so sad because it's always going to be the godmother of your baby's baptism, your best friend, the lady, you know, you just trust, 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 trust. And on that embezzlement case, you said it was the biggest one in Illinois. How much money were you talking about? Um, they reported that they got about, it was reported that there was about 500,000 that was embezzled. And not only the saddest thing with that, I was referred to that dentist by an attorney. Um, and by the you know grace of God and, and my, uh, my years of experience, immediately I told the dentist to not deposit any insurance checks going forward. Um, the employee um, contacted him the day I was there to close him into my program. And, and basically blackmailed him and said, if you don't meet me at the Burger King with 300000 I'm going to the feds. That's exactly what she did. She went to the feds. Within seven days, the DEA and the feds came into his office, pulled charts, pulled chips out of the computer, and basically that's where it started. And um, again, that went all the way to, you know, it, 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 was, it was a serious case. So she was saying, don't report me for embezzling or I'm reporting you for drugs? Well, for um, for insurance malpractice and for 
insurance fraud, um, and then well, because the DEA. Well, I think that's who came in the DEA. Well, that'd be um, for drugs. That'd be for prescriptions. Well, it, yeah, it wasn't prescriptions. Maybe I'm wrong with the with the group that came in, but that there were. No, there were federal agents that came in to pull the chips from the computer and pull the chart. She gave them patient's name. What she basically did was she was committing insurance fraud and accused the dentist of it. And because, it, you know, as you know, insurance filing is interstate, it was a federal offense. So I, I, know, a, I know a dentist and he didn't even know his uh, office manager, who's his wife, who had a big spending problem. She started doing insurance fraud. And it's one thing when you do insurance fraud in state with your local dental insurance company, but when you do insurance fraud across the state line, now it's federal, or you do it with Medicaid, I swear to God, Medicaid. I mean, when the government shows up for insurance fraud on Medicaid, if they need to hang a little picture on the wall, they'll bring a sledgehammer to drive the nail in. And they came down on him so hard the only thing he could do was flee to mexico he's been practicing in mexico for the last 10 years and as i uh, you know but um but again these dentists will go drop thirty five hundred dollars on a course uh to learn occlusion and tmj and all this stuff and they don't even know they've been embezzled for the last five years and it, or, and it's just like the misdirection i mean i get it I know chefs just want to cook and bake. I get it. I, I watch cake wars or um, the cupcake wars or, you know, I, I, I've seen these guys with all the passion of me wanting to do a Molaru canal and building a damn cupcake. I get it. But you know what? Your little cupcake business will go out of business if you don't know the business. And I'm trying to take the nose from this puppy who just wants to make a cupcake and say, how do you not have any checks and balances on embezzlement? Why can one, when one person can do everything, they embezzle? And why do you think that hot receptionist really wants to sleep with you? Because she's holding something over you. When you start um, sleeping with an employee, then, then when you catch them, they say, well, do you want me to call your wife and tell her we've been having an affair and that divorce will cost you a million or do you want to look the other way that I sold 500,000 and I'll quit today same thing when they get addicted to narcotics I mean if you're addicted to narcotics call your local uh, American Dental Association tripartite and say hey I can't quit eating Vicodin and they'll give you the name of the dentist they'll get you help they'll get this over with um, but when you're sharing DEA narcotics when you're sleeping with your deal there's a reason that woman wants to sleep with you and you looking like Brad Pitt is not in the top 1000 reasons of why she's sleeping with you. And, and most consultants that I talk to say when they go into a dental office and they start running these reports, 50% of the dentists are getting embezzled from and a hundred percent of the dentists can't run one damn audit trail report. In fact, I wish you'd make an online C course for dental town. I, I really do. I wish you would make an online C course. These guys, um, these guys, to be a leader, you got to take them from what they want to do to what they don't want to do and need to do. They need to do um, the more business stuff, and they just don't. Um, I want to switch gears completely, uh, do a 180. Yeah, before you switch, let me just add one more okay, thought. Okay, okay. The one thing that I would say is that it's important to a dentist to realize what they don't know and be open to being coached. And, and I don't mean, you know, I mean really being open to being coached about how to identify what to look for on these reports. To me, I'm doing a great job if I can teach every one of my clients to be a consultant. I don't need to be with them for the rest of their career. You know, hey, that's great. I have clients that I've been with for years. That's wonderful. But at the end of the day, I've really done my job if I can teach them how to be the best consultant they know they could be. And that means analyzing those numbers and really fully understanding how that practice is supposed to work. So go on to your next subject. Sorry about that. Well, when I asked you when, um, you know, uh, McDonald's has a hamburger, fry, and a Coke, I sell a root canal filling, crown cleaning. I said, what, what are your top three orders? And you said staffing, growth issues, and bustle. I mean, staffing. I mean, my gosh. If I lined 100 dentists up and I said, what's the only thing that gives you a knot in your stomach that makes you want to puke? It's always HR. 
it's always HR, and they're always way too slow to fire. I find it so amazing that when I'm lecturing, I will meet an office, and I'll have lunch with them, or they'll come up and ask me, and you can, I can tell that Shirley is toxic poison in like five seconds, like when the dentist is talking to me, and we're sitting at a round table, and she's rolling her eyes. I'm like... She's rolling her, that, that's your, that's the person you're paying to support the team. And she's rolling her eyes in front of you, in front of, I mean, so how do you get these people to understand HR? It, um, yesterday was, um, um, you know, every Sunday's NFL. And I mean, it's just finding the right players. I mean, if you find the right players, you win the game. You know how many teams in the NFL today with the existing quarterback they have, they don't even have a chance of making the playoffs. And everyone in the stadium knows their quarterback is insane. I mean, you, you hear 60-year-old ladies saying, you know, hell, I could have thrown that interception. Um, so how does a dentist get his hands around HR? I think a big way to get your hands around HR is first and foremost to identify First and foremost, identify what is it that your vision and mission is for your team. What does that team look like, act like? So write it down. What is that vision? Then secondarily, in interviewing or or discovering who's on your team, is laying out the expectations. I think a big problem in staffing is mismatched expectations. The dentist does not clearly identify for that staff. This is what I expect out of you. These are This is your job description, and this is how it needs to be handled. What they do is they say, I want you to run the front desk. I want you to you know, be, be a great dental assist with no sense of direction, no sense of written job description. And, and then in addition, I think there has to be a mutual level of respect. I think the human relation element, the human relation principles, and you know, having been trained in all levels of Dale Carnegie, I'm a big supporter of treating people the way you want to be treated. And that goes from the front to the back and the back to the front in a dental office. I think so often dentists keep people because, oh, she's really good at collecting or she's really good at scheduling or she's really good at assisting when she's toxic. As you said, she's toxic to everyone else on the team. And so what happens is you end up losing great team members because they simply can't put up with it anymore. And the dentist is so blinded by the control of that one person when really if it's laid out from the front end here's my vision and mission here's the type of staff i want this is how i want you to act this is how i want you to dress this is how i want patients to be treated and if patient care is at the forefront of that and we're constantly focused on that with those human relation elements and the personality profile types I think you will have a successful team. I also think a successful team comes from investing in that team, you know, it putting in dollars to train your team. So often dentists want this idealistic, you know, team, but and they and they maybe have a vision for it and they maybe have it written down, but they, they can't train that team. They're dentists. They haven't worked every position like like the staff has. And so in order to really be a great, successful business owner, in my opinion, you have to realize your shortcomings and be open to accepting someone to coach them and coach you to be a better leader. Hey, you just started, you just added uh, Twitter and Instagram to your deal. I'm your only follower on Twitter and Instagram. That's my claim to fame that the legendary Gene St. Louis, I'm your, so, so make a tweet, um, about that we did a podcast today and I will forward that to my 25,000 homies who follow me on Twitter and thank you so much that means the world to me and uh, and when you post on Instagram tag me and I got 15,000 on Instagram and um, the Instagram are all millennials and the Twitter are all baby boomers Um, but uh, I think that'll be amazing but back to your website um, you have basically um, four uh, programs. I want you to go through them. What is, define your startup elite program at GeneStLouisConsulting.com versus your acquisition program versus practice evaluations 
versus Platinum Consulting Program. Um, t- t- talk about what you uh, specifics is what I want to do as a leader. I want this person driving to work right now to see if they're a match with you. You know, if this is something to solve their problem. So start with the Startup Elite Program and then just go through your programs. Yeah. So the Startup Elite Program is a program whereby I help dentists from the front end identify um, where they should be opening their practice. So everything from location to um, helping them and aligning their team, attorney, accountant, equipment, looking over all their bids, keeping their budget on track for a startup, helping them um, train their staff going on site, helping them hire the right team members, and helping them grow their business in the first year. So the startup program is really working with a dentist that wants to do a a cold startup, a de novo, if you will. So really taking them from creating a business plan, a performa to your budget, looking and helping them assess the banking, looking and helping them assess every bid that comes in from every contractor, every supply person, every equipment person, and helping them make decisions along the way. And then once they all of that work on the front end Um, is not counted as part of their year program. Their year officially begins when I go on site with them and meet with them one-on-one and do a leadership program for them. And then from that point forward, that's their first year. So that leadership program begins maybe two months before they open. All the time prior to that is not included in the year. So they're really getting like 18 months or two years of, of help, coaching, weekly, unlimited emails, unlimited phone calls, the whole relationship time. And what does that cost? That costs $24,945. Yeah, and, and let me let me tell you, you kids, you crazy, crazy kids, you'll spend you'll spend a hundred and twenty four thousand dollars on a Lenap laser. You'll spend a hundred and twenty four thousand on a uh, CAD CAM machine when you could have sent a $17 Impergum impression to your lab and got a Bruxer made for $98. I mean, you just, I mean, I swear to God, you'll buy, you'll, you'll spend, you just, your number one return on investment is that program. $25,000. I, I, I recommend so many programs that are $50,000. And I can tell you that when you're as old as me, Every dentist that's as old as me that's doing two to four million a year and taking home five hundred thousand dollars a year probably had four or five of these twenty five to fifty thousand dollar consultants over the last uh, three decades. They they never say, Oh, I'm a student of this person. They said, Man, I tried them all. I never ever had a consultant where if I paid them a dollar to come in, I didn't get that dollar back plus more inside the time period uh, on a statement of cash flow. I mean, it's the best investment and I understand why you want to spend $125,000 on a laser. I get it. It's a toy. Uh, my grandchildren don't want to take a bath unless there's at least six toys in the bathtub. Um, God, I had a, over Thanksgiving, one of my grandchildren simply wanted to take a bath just because she wanted to give her horsey a bath. And it was uh, some horsey out of a freaking Happy Meal. There. I, n- I never thought you could buy a Happy Meal and it end up in the bathtub. Um, so that is the number one return investment. Okay, you also have another program, acquisition program. Talk about that one. So an acquisition program is a program for a doctor who is purchasing a practice. So I generally begin with a due diligence or a practice evaluation. And those range anywhere from $1,700 to $1,950 for me to do a comprehensive due diligence which includes a demographics, a the analysis, um, an executive summary, really going over all the details of that practice from the practice business aspect. I look at two years of tax returns, two years of profit and loss statements. I analyze that practice in much depth. I then share that knowledge with, if they have a CPA or an attorney that they're dealing with, so that that attorney knows you know, any elements that need to be put into the purchaser's agreement, so that the accountant sees what I've identified on the practice management end. That is, once they're done with that practice evaluation, they can elect to use me for coaching through the transition. So helping them with the transition letter all the way through the timeline of element of 
that closing. So eight weeks before the closing, what does the attorney need to get done? What does the accountant need to get done? What do they need to do? What about insurance credentialing? Switching over if the practice is on PPOs to that doctor's PPO. Um, really looking at the practice and helping the team bring in this dentist who is now their new owner. In many acquisitions, the um, transition is totally confidential. So the staff maybe find out on a Friday that the doctor has sold the practice and there's a new dentist coming in on Monday. And in many times, that dentist that has been there for 30 years is done, gone, on vacation, away. Thank goodness, some of them stay on for a period of time. But even in those situations, it's not, you know, there's so much um, loyalty to the previous owner that there does definitely need to be some coaching of the team and helping them I always um, explain to the buyer that, you know, this seller, this is their baby. They grew it, you know, and they're very, while they're selling it, they ha it's a bittersweet. There's mixed emotions of this, you know, yes, I want to sell and yes, I did sell, but oh, I'm, I'm losing my patients and my staff and all of that. So I think the acquisition program lends itself and I offer a variation of coaching with that depending upon time frame that the doctor and I choose is best for the practice. So and that ranges, that ranges anywhere from um, 21000 ish or 20000 ish to, I think, maybe 34000 35000 Yeah, but depending you, on you wouldn't want to spend $20,000 to analyze something you're going to buy for seven hundred and fifty. dollars Wouldn't you rather just wing the whole $750,000 purchase? Well, the due diligence, <laughs> <laughs> the due diligence is even less than that. I call I it a home. It's like 1950 at the high end. Um, the acquisition is only if they choose to get help once they purchase. Yeah, and, and they're just so it's so crazy. I know a, I know a dentist who bought a practice, bought a practice. It was in a 10-year lease in a retail center. Didn't even read the lease. He wasn't even in there for a year. And in his lease, the tenant had permission to kick his butt out because the major anchor, if the major anchor needs to expand, they can kick out uh, the, the little shops next to the big old grocery store. So he buys this, buys this office and then he's, and I'm like, well, my God, what, what did the real estate attorney say who reviewed your lease? Oh, oh uh, I, I reviewed it myself because I thought uh, my background in chemistry and biochem and human tooth morphology would, would substitute for reading a real estate lease. But your, your platinum program, how much is your platinum consulting program? How long does that last? Um, what do you do for the dentists who are trying to take their practice to the next oh. level? Not a cookie cutter program, um, totally customizable talk with the dentist, really kind of get an understanding as to what, that's for an existing practice owner, get an understanding as to what's going on in their practice, what are their needs, and then together the two of us pick what, you know, what does that look like? What kind of help do you want? Do you want phone call help or do you want on-site help? And how often do you want to see me? Do you want to see me once a month or do you want to see me once a year? Or how does that look? So, Again, I, I like to customize the program based on the client relationship and talking with them and seeing their needs. I, I know that, you know, every consultant out there says, oh, I don't have a cookie cutter operation. And then, you know, you talk to dentists and they go, they all have a cookie cutter operation. Yeah, but you know what every dental consultant has on their website, which you don't? They always say, they always have um, reviews and it's by Dr. Uh, J period D period uh, Indiana. You have actual names, Dr. Leonardo, Leonard Miata, you, uh, Dr. Ed Hanley, Cambridge Dental. I mean, every single one of your programs has reviews where it has the dentist's picture, their name, the, the name of the, I mean, you're completely transparent. I mean, I mean, if, if I told you I did the most famous movie star in the world and I redid her whole mouth and she's in all the movies and her name's um, movie star from planet earth. I mean, I mean, what, what do you, talking about i love how the fact that you actually give a picture a name and the name of the dental practice the city it's in i mean you're you're the real deal um what do you what do you um mean when you talk about strategic relationships strategic relationships to me are the ability to network with people in the industry to really understand who's out there what they're doing and why and to share that knowledge with 
my, you know, my potential or current customers, clients. I feel that I, I don't, when I say a strategic relationship, it doesn't necessarily mean money exchanges hands, as I said from the beginning. I think the most important thing in a strategic relationship is that it's mutually beneficial to both, meaning that they understand what I do as a business and I understand what they do as a business. They've helped my clients and have serviced my clients well. And for that reason, I feel they're warranted to be on a page that's called strategic relationships. And that's the, uh, you're, so it's not a, a, an advertising, it's not a money change hand, but, um, but, uh, but some of these are, uh, w- w- let's go through some of these. You, you have five on your deal. Um, revenue. Well, I, I, I bet you 90% of the kids listening to this that are under 30 don't even know what revenue well is. What is revenue well? And why is that a strategic relationship? Revenue well, I find is a really great product that dentists can use in their practice and it was one of the original ones that came out from a patient perspective of texting patients confirmations helping them with you know helping the office to deliver better customer service to their patient base how does that happen it happens because you have a platform like revenue well that syncs with your software that allows you to be able to have your staff not be on a phone confirming patients per se, or sending out you know um, email notices. One of the things I love about Revenue Well is, say you come in today and you're the front desk person and you have cancellations today, later in the day, you can send out a text message to patients that are past due for those hygiene appointments. And you could say something like, um, first come first serve, I have a two o'clock and a four o'clock opening today. You already are sending it. You can target to those patients that are already late, that are within like a 10 minute drive time, um, and you get responses. So to me, that that makes so much more sense than having a person get on the phone and dial for dollars and trying to get those patients in. Yes, that's important, but isn't it great? Most people respond by a text. I mean, I know you, you do, I do, you know, most of our children do, most millennials do. Um, people like text. And so I think that that's a great source that Revenue Well has amongst a, a gazillion other things they offer. I'm just scratching on the surface there. So they, they offer a lot of great things there. Who, who's the CEO of Revenue Well and where are they out of? I work with Michelle Gabrielson. Um, they're based out of Bannockburn, Illinois. Um, and the CEO um, is Alex, and I'm, his last name is slipping my mind, but um, great company. Well, will you tell the CEO to come on the show and talk about Revenue Well? I absolutely will. Okay. Absolutely. So I want to go to uh, another uh, one. But by the way, you offered me an hour of your life. I just passed an hour. Can I keep you just a couple more overtime questions? Absolutely. Not a problem. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to go back to um, on these strategic relationships. The other one, which they don't know, um, HR for health, number one in human resources for doctors. Why is that one of your strategic relationships? I love that company for a couple of reasons. One is um, the CEO is an attorney who also, an HR attorney, who's also married to a dentist. So right off the bat, oh, poor thing. <laughs> um, he is extremely knowledgeable in HR law. He's not only a litigator, but he also is, is really extremely knowledgeable, not just in HR law, but in, in dentistry. He's, he focuses a lot on medical and dental. His name is Ali Aramshian. And HR for Health, I love their program and their platform because it allows the employee and the employer, what I find often occurs in dental practices is lack of knowledge of what your staff is doing or not doing. Having all your HR documents and making sure that you're compliant within the state that you operate in and that your staff has filled out and signed everything and it's all online, it's all in a porthole, um, is awesome. The fact that they can help answer any HR questions that you have, they help with, you know, your office policy manual. That's all, you know, comprehensive. They even have payroll service as a part of that. Um, and, and I just feel that they are very responsive to clients that I've dealt with. And they do a really good job. And so for that reason, I feel they're warranted to be on that strategic relationship page. 
Okay, you have three more. I want to go through them all. We did revenue well, H over held. One is Bank of America. Is that for mostly practice uh, acquisition? Acquisition and startup. Bank of America is only one of a few banks that actually will work with a startup dentist doing a de novo. Um, what I like about them is they have a comprehensive approach. They have project. We have an outside person that deals with the dentist when they first come to them. And that outside person works with a team on the inside of project managers and people that make sure that that project flows according to the budget. So in a, let's talk about a de novo situation, a startup situation. I love the idea that I can help have the bank who's lending them the money, have a vested interest in how they spend their money. Not big brother vested interest, but really knowing that, hey, Jean's worked with them. She set up a business plan. She set up a performa. We know what the expenses are going to be for the years, two years that the practice is in work. And we see what the expenses are initially for the startup costs. Um, from an acquisition standpoint, I like that a bank looks at the tax returns, obviously, and looks at the details behind that acquisition to know, is this someone we should lend the money to? Does, the, does it cash flow? I don't want a client to deal with a bank that has no vested interest in the cash flow of the practice. You know, aside from the fact that you're going to have a hard time paying back your loan if they don't look at your cash flow, it's not going to be good for you if it doesn't cash flow to give you an income to live on and you have to associate even though you just bought a practice. Makes no sense. Well, you know what makes no sense to me about Bank of America is why, um, you know, everybody's afraid DSOs are taking over the world. Bank of America, you like, they're one of your trusted strategic alliances, but no one ever talks about the earth shattering fact that it was, um, it was November 30th. It was this day, this 11:26. but it was two years ago this week that the big monster East West Bank uh, stopped loaning money to group dental practices. They shut down their entire dental lending platform. Um, it left uh, over 100 group practices and DSOs wondering where they're going to turn for capital. And the reason was is because they, this, this, as the DSOs get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, East West Bank needed to leave that space. And I'm not sure all the emails I read were, I can't talk about it. Um, you know, I'm a journalist because I've had a monthly, I've owned my own uh, dental magazine since, um, um, hell, 1994. And uh, so, um, so I, I don't know what all I can talk about or get sued over but but i mean it was amazing i mean th these people think dso's are going to take over the world and here east west bank shuts down the entire division and not one of them can go public yet they're all sitting around san diego thinking oh one day we're all gonna work for a dso it's it's like why why am i the only person uh that is not can I, I mean i'm completely convinced that it's going to be what I already lived through before in the 80s where Orthodontic Centers of America was publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange or the dozen on NASDAQ and that every last one of them imploded. And then they went away and now they came back and the, dentist, the dentists are afraid of this Godzilla, but Wall Street isn't. They know what they are and they won't touch them and either will East West Bank. Well, you know what's interesting? I, in your, in your, in regards to DSOs, I have had lengthy conversations with colleagues, um, other key opinion leaders that are convinced that DSOs are, that's the way of the future and that's what's happening. And I, with you, agree that DSOs are not the wave of the future and that Joe Dentist and Joe Dentist, who's been associating, does not want to sell to a DSO. That's the reality. The dentists that sell to the DSO, and the other thing is DSOs are not picking up the dentist that's 70, 75 years old that's doing 500,000. They're picking up bigger practices. So all of those practices that are out there of those baby boomers, they're going to come on the market, and it's going to be a boom. And those dentists that are millennials are going to be buying those practices, and they're not DSOs. And so those dentists that are baby boomers right now that are fearing the DSOs and dentistry sucks because it's all DSOs now, I, I want to wring their necks and say, get over it. And, and like you, I've been in dentistry long enough to see the pendulum has been there and it's coming the other way. And just, you know, the reality of it is, is there's going to be plenty of dentistry for 
dentists, solo practitioners to practice the way they want. In regards to the banks lending or not lending, I had dealt with East West Bank. I was very involved with them. I trained their sales force. Um, you know what? I don't have a, a, a nay or yay as to why East West went under. I, I have some opinions. That's another whole podcast we could do. Um, I'm sure you have opinions about it as well. All I know is Bank of America treats the customers that have, that have dealt with them um, in the way that I think they should be treated. You know, so that's it. Well, well, I think East West Bank shut down the division. Money is the answer. Was from they they, they were having too many uh, troubled loans, and uh, they they don't have confidence in space. I, well, well, I well, there's another thing. You know, when people say DSOs, they immediately think of Heartland, Aspen, Pacific. They, they, those guys have over 500 offices to a thousand each. But most all the DSOs are two or three or four locations. And uh, Dennis has this big million dollar practice and he decides, oh, I have this big million dollar practice in a town of 30,000. I'm on the south side. I want to open one on the north, south, east, west. And it's not until they expand to the second or third locations when they realize they don't have the right people, the right systems. And when you had that $1 million practice with 10 ops and an associate, you could muscle around all your problems that were like, little Doberman pinchers in the corner. But the minute you borrowed other people's money and expanded two or three locations and there's not enough hours in the week, those little Doberman pinchers turned into King Kong and Godzilla and took you down. In fact, most people don't realize the sweet spot of a dental bankruptcy is in their expansion somewhere between the two and four million dollar mark. So when you're loaning a bunch of loans to these DSOs that don't have a proven model, that don't have proven systems, that don't have the right people driving the bus, um, you know, that second to third to fourth location is usually going under. I want to I'll switch to one last question. I got one more question for you. One of your other ones, well, you have two more that I haven't talked, Care Credit and Patterson. But what I like about Care Credit the most has nothing to do with their business. What I like about Care Credit the most is that you can have Care Credit come in your office and they can show you what everybody in your zip code and county and city is borrowing money because the dentist wants to blame all their problems on anybody but the man in the mirror. You know, every problem is caused by their mom, their dad, Obama, Putin, you know, and then they sit there and say, okay, well, here's a Care Credit report and you're bar, you're financing two thousand dollars a month, and there's a dentist across the street from you that's doing twenty five thousand a month, and he lives in the same town as you do. And then some of the craziest stuff is that the number one cosmetic surgery in America is actually eyelid surgery, and these girls are financing at four thousand dollars, probably. 10 eyelid surgeries for every major dental case in every major town in America. And the average American between the age of 16 and 76 will buy 13 new cars for a median mode average price of 33500 and 95% of all the dentists in America will never do a single case for 33500 And every time some dentist gets financed on care credit, 10 women finance 4000 for eyelid surgery. And at 56 years old, I still have never seen a woman who I thought her eyelid was good or bad. I didn't even know eyelids were an issue. I mean, it'd be like saying, well, don't you think that lady's ugly because of her little toe? I, I didn't know a little toe or an eyelid could be good or bad. I thought that, I mean, it's, it's, isn't it just like a gallbladder or something? Um, so do you agree that dentists should have care credit come in their office just to show them the potential healthcare financing market in their own county? Without a doubt, unequivocally, one of the things I do love about care credit is they teach, which echoes exactly what I do in my industry, they teach how to make dentistry affordable. The problem in dental practices is, is we have a person that's working behind the desk or presenting financials who may or may not be making 20 to 60,000, unlikely, but say 60 on the high end. And they can't present the financials to the patient of what the dentist presented in dentistry. If everyone in their mind could just make 
a mind shift and say, my role is to make dentistry affordable. That's what care credit allows the practice to do. That's why I love having the rep come into the practice is because they really work with them, coinciding with what I can teach them to say, it is all about making dentistry affordable. Patients spend money on what they want to spend money on. You just said it, eyelids, but let's take it back, even dial it back to they get their hair highlighted, they get their artificial nails done, they have, you know, a $200 pair of jeans on. I mean, I could go on and on. People will spend money on things they want. Our job in the dental practice is creating the want. If the dentist can create the want, the front desk or the financial coordinator's job is to make it affordable. How do you make it affordable? It sure as hell is not giving them a care credit brochure and saying, we offer care credit. It's sitting down, eye to eye, knee to knee, having a piece of paper, going through exactly what the financial arrangement could be. What is the dollar amount? I remember presenting this to a team, and the front desk person was in her 20s, and she said to me, you know, Jean, if the doctor presented a crown to me, there's no way I could afford $1,200. And I said, okay. To prove my point, I took the piece of paper that I was educating them on, on how to make dentistry affordable, and I said, let me ask you something. Could you afford $50 a month? And she laughed, and she said, you know, I, yeah, I, I spend $50 a month at the bar. I don't, you know, like, like, yeah, of course I can. So because we just say, Mrs. Jones, your crown is $1,200, not Mrs. Jones, you could pay half and half, a third, a third, payment over six months or 12 months, payment over... 60 months, what the heck do we care how long it takes a patient to pay off a crown or multiple crowns? That's making dentistry affordable. That's why I love care credit. They have a a market share hold, and I think they deserve it. They treat their customers well. They educate. They have that report, as you mentioned, that kind of really takes it broad. I think the problem that a lot of dentists have is they they don't want to offer the beyond 12 months. Oh, no, I don't want to pay care credit. They're expensive. Really? How expensive are they when you're not doing the dentistry? You know, it's all relative, right? Yeah, and it's also not the unit price. It's the case price per hour. I mean, the, these guys that do financing, they just say, well, yeah, you just come in Friday, and um, the only question is, uh, can you afford this monthly payment for the next 36 months? And A, do you want to be awake or do you want me to bring in a board-certified anesthesiologist to put you to sleep? Half the market's afraid of the dentistry and half the market's afraid of the price. And what do the dentists do? They don't, they, 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 they go in there and they make insurance to God. They go, oh, well, I'm sorry, Gene St. Louis, but um, um, you have 28 crappy teeth and five of them are broken and infected, uh, but your insurance only pays a thousand a year. So we're just going to pick the crappiest tooth in your head and do a root canal bill and crown on this molar here and then at the first year our lord god and savior delta dental will give us a new thousand dollar maximum and then we'll we'll treat the second shittiest tooth in your head and and that's 95 percent of the dental market the other five percent walk in and say uh hey gene um Congratulations, you got great credit. We can do everything you and the doctor talked about for $118 a month for 36 months. Does that sound like something you want to do? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, well, you know, you haven't been to the dentist for five years. Is that dental phobia? I mean, do you want us to put you to sleep for that? Or do you just want to do it on like nitrous oxide? And they go, oh, I want to put to sleep. And those are the guys that every Friday will have one or two patients for 25 grand. They do it 50 weeks a year and they're just crushing it because and then and some of these dentists i'll say will you just uh, i've been in the office i'll say well you just told her that her insurance will pay a thousand and then her portion is six thousand and it's a hundred dollars a month for this many months uh, but i didn't see anybody call the insurance company and verify that and they go howard it's a thousand it's a thousand bucks. I don't even care. I don't even care if they pay or not. I mean, it's a six thousand dollar case, and I'm going to do the whole damn case in a couple hours. And then as they get older and older and older, and they have these big cases, say they're in Phoenix, Arizona, and they're like, "Oh my God, I got Jean St. Louis coming in Friday, and she's going to be put to sleep with an anesthesiologist because you don't want to do that yourself. Because if something goes south, you don't want to. You, you don't know anesthesiologists. I don't care what how many courses you took. And number two. 
They're like, I don't even want to do three molar root canals on Friday morning. I mean, three molar root canals back to back. So they'll call an Enadonis from the next town over and he'll come in Friday and they split the revenue with it 50 50. I mean, I know dentists who sit there and go on Friday and all they do is press the flesh until the patient's put to sleep. Then an endodontist will come in and do three molar root canals. Then a periodontist comes in and places five root canals. I mean, five implants. And, and, and I mean, it's just, it's just my gosh. Uh, but hey, I took you to triple overtime. I just want to tell you that the only reason this show is a smash is because I'm able to get legends like you to come on the show. Uh, thank you for your 30 years of commitment to dentistry, and thank you for coming on the show today and talking to my homies. Thank you. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you giving me the time as well. All right. Have a rocking hot day, Gene.